For those of you who aren't familiar with me, um, my, I am a soul scientist, um, kind of a rare breed. Um, so you're going to get this, um, you know, more of a discussion and, and bringing into really like more of a highlight of what happens with soils in your garden and the interaction between fertilizers, pesticides, and soils. And one of the things that I, I want to, you know, really highlight also is that, you know, typically when people think about fertilizers and pesticides, right, pesticides are for a purpose. And a pesticide is just something that controls a pest. So under the guise of, or under the, you know, category of pesticides are herbicides, which is for plants, insecticides, fungicides, and, you know, and so on and so forth. So pesticides are, are, are really just a, a large group of, you know, something to control a pest. Um, and then fertilizers are something that we add to the soils to typically to enhance plant growth, um, to make them grow bigger. And, you know, since this is a garden talk and we're, we want more beautiful vegetables and more of them and, and so forth. Um, but in, in, even though, you know, buying fertilizers and pesticides is a, is a pretty common practice, you know, spraying right now everybody's trying to enhance the growth of their trees and veggies and flower gardens, usually people don't really think about what happens underground, right? We kind of just think about, okay, well, I'm gonna put this fertilizer on and look at the plant and that's my, you know, gonna be my sign of whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing or whatnot. And typically we don't, we're not really thinking about, okay, what does that fertilizer or pesticide do once it's in the ground? Um, what is it doing to other systems as well, right? Besides just the plants or the insect, insect that I'm trying to kill. Um, so, um, what I really want to focus in then is, is kind of different fertilizers and pesticides, um, kind of pros and cons with a distinct application, not only to our region actually, but also specifically also to garden soils. Um, so I'm going to do kind of two, two different applications. Um, and um, I also, the other kind of focus I would like to also um, highlight is that you know one of the big communities that is greatly affected by fertilizers and pesticides are actually the community that goes unnoticed and that's the microbial community um, in soils. So again we typically focus on kind of like okay what is a, a pesticide or something due to when it gets into groundwater or surface waters if somebody's going to think about it you know that's kind of our sign is like oh is this maybe not a good thing for the system is it more toxic to fish or birds or, or my, my dog that's running across my lawn right Typically, people aren't really thinking about, like, hey, what, are, what is this possibly doing to all the microbial community? And I, I think, so my, my focus here, if I'm being really honest and transparent, is on the two probably dismissed systems um, in our society, which is soil, or what people call dirt, soil, and, and microbes, bacteria, right? We have this very antibacterial kind of notion in society, and yet bacteria and microbes are, like, vastly important um, in systems. And so the health of our soil system for the overall health is really really important and that's something that most people don't really consider so those are the things like kind of going to get a gear towards and also thinking about you know gardens and and particularly soils in, in our region um, so i put out a you know a kind of a variety of uh, fertilizers pesticides uh, different things that you you know commonly purchase from you know manure to some broad uh, garden, what they call them like weed and feed, so something that fertilizes your lawn and also kills off those um, uh, you know, weeds that you don't want around, uh, some slow release fertilizers, some quick fertilizers, uh, some things that are what we call like broad spectrum uh, uh, pesticides, meaning that they kind of kill everything in sight, uh, versus things that are a little bit more selective and some more organic things. So um, we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of what they do in the soil. Um, I also wanted to kind of pose a couple questions uh, to you um, about this. And so um, I guess a lot of people are kind of familiar with uh, the soils in general, but what do you think happens when these products hit the soil? Do they just stay there? What is it? What happens? What do you, what are some things? Like, so I'm trying to like, you know, leaching. most people... Leaching into the ground. Okay, what do you mean by leaching? It infiltrates it's the soil its particles and going further down. Okay, yeah. so it potentially can move with water, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's an important thing to realize. And the reason why I'm trying to start this conversation is because, again, I think it's kind of this outside of mind thing, right? A lot of people just 
growth fertilizer on. I would suspect a lot of people don't follow the instructions necessarily, right? Now, maybe they're putting out right before it rains, and if, there's, if it's raining in the area, that's way more potential for things to move off-site where they're not even intended, right? So, um, uh, you know, moving, uh, leaching, thing, leaching is like a, is a fancy word in soil for saying it's going to move through the soil system and into deeper layers, okay? Um, can it potentially move off-site? Like if, you, if we spread some stuff on the lawn, could it move, you know, could the sidewalk move into a river or whatnot and, and not even interact, right? Okay, yes. So these are some questions that I, I love that you guys are all saying, yes, of course it can, right? But, but I think the average person isn't really thinking about that, right? It's just sort of like, okay, I gotta kill these weeds, I gotta kill that insect, I'm gonna have a 4th of July barbecue, I wanna get rid of all these things, right? So there's, there's, there, I, I, I would speculate and feel pretty safe on, on betting that most people who are applying fertilizers, pesticides, are not, are really just kind of thinking of like, what is my desired effect? And not really thinking about the more holistic aspect that happens um, in systems. And part of that system is also the soil system as well. Okay. Um, do you think geography matters as far as like where, you know, if we apply some of these products, how they might interact or work with the soil? So what are some things that you might think, how, how do you think geography might influence this? If you're in a desert, it's not moving very much. If you're here in the Pacific Northwest, it's a lot more rain. Right. So. so climate, right? So if there's an area with a lot more precipitation or even water moving through the ground, that can actually change um, the system quite a bit as well. Um, geography also has a huge influence on the type of soil that is present. And a lot of people think it's just dirt and it's been there forever, but soils are drastically different. They're incredibly variable. If we dug a hole here and a hole there and a hole there, we'd find different um, things. I mean, we could do some broad properties that would be similar, but there's an incredible variability in soils. And one of the biggest things that influences it is actually climate and how it forms. So um, it turns out that in hot, wet areas, like tropical regions that get a lot of moisture and are very warm, those soils are typically a lot more older, weathered soils. They actually behave differently than what I'm gonna be talking about, okay? So it's almost like the complete opposite of what I'm gonna to say today, okay? Um, soils in our region, like temperate regions, they're typically what we consider to be like younger soils or kind of like more middle-aged soils, so they're not really, really old. So those are the kind of soils when I'm talking about like properties and different things that are gonna happen, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the tropical really, really old soils because it's actually the flip. So we're gonna just going to focus on our region and, and garden soils and what most people have um, in their garden. Um, now, uh, let's see here. I want to kind of just try and keep a little bit on track here. Um, you're going to edit some of this out. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so one of the things that uh, really drastically influences, besides climate and the amount of moisture, if you're thinking about how, does, how do these products interact with the soil system, it's actually going to have a lot to do with the texture of the soil. And a lot of people here are familiar with the texture because they were the first garden talk, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, a lot, when we think about texture, just in general, world, sometimes we think about like smooth or rough, and that's not, that's not a bad characteristic to at least start the conversation about soil texture. So soils are made up of three different particle sizes, sands, silts, and clays. And they combine in different ratios to form different textures. So we can form soils that are more sandy. We can form soils that are more silty or more clay or something in between, which is a type of soil we call a loam. And that's a really ideal soil for, for gardening. It's a nice compromise between a lot of features. Um, so the, the type of texture, whether it's more sandy or more clay, we're gonna kind of focus on the extremes here, realizing that silts are kind of in the middle. And before I go any further, it's gonna be important that I kind of differentiate this. So um, sand, the difference between sand, silt, and clay, one of the very first things is the size. And sands are huge. One particle of sand, this is obviously just relative sizes, okay? Um, but one sand particle is ginormous. It is huge compared to a, even a, it's funny, golf ball, even to a, a silt particle, which is, we can kind of think about that as the size of a golf ball, okay? So one sand particle, humongous compared to one silt. And these are humongous compared to the size of one clay particle, which would be about the size of the head of a pin, okay? So if you start talking about surface area, 
clays actually have an incredible amount of surface area because if we took one gram of clay versus one gram of sand, one gram of clay is gonna have an enormous amount more of surface area and that means it's more surfaces to interact with stuff, things like water, fertilizers, pesticides, all these different things. So the, the texture, whether it's something's more sandy or more clay or more silt, is going to really influence how fertilizers and pesticides interact and how water flows and how much water is retained in the soil as well, okay? So, we have that, okay? So, we, are there any questions about texture and all this? So, we're doing really quick, okay? Um, it turns out that in our region, we actually have a lot of sandy soils, to be honest. So, we have, it's not to say that our soils are only this, that's not what I'm suggesting, but we have a lot of the big basketballs. Okay. So our soils in the Pacific, in, in I should say in the Seattle area, we actually have a lot of kind of the sandier soils, unless you're in a wetland or something like that. But we're going to keep that conversation to a different one. Um, so um, I just alluded to the fact this is a huge difference between a clay and sa clay soils and sandy soils. Okay, and. I bet that a lot of you are actually pretty familiar with how water flows through sandy versus clay soils. If you've ever tried to make a sand castle, right, and you make a moat around the sand castle and you dump water into it, it just immediately drains out, right? It's very, very quick. The infiltration rate in sands are huge, is huge because you have a lot of big, gigantic basketballs, right? And if you have a lot of basketballs, big gigantic things don't pack together very well. So there's enormous pores between the particles, which really enhances water flow, okay? If you instead you had a bunch of tiny, tiny little pieces clumped together, then there's very, very, very tiny little pore spaces where that water has to go through too. So that means water is gonna flow through much, much more slowly in a clay soil than in a sandy soil, okay? And, Give you a little demo here okay so here we have um, a sandy soil like a layer of sand on top of something that's more silt so this is not clay but it is definitely something of a finer smaller size this one we have um, silt on the top and sand on the bottom let's see if i can do this without getting everything wet so i'm gonna in a quick fashion here we're just gonna try to see how this flows and this conversation, this is a really good conversation because what we're doing, we're, what we're watching here is saturated water flow. And so you can see how the water is moving through this, but much, much more slowly than this. Okay, now this is cheating a little bit. I think on this side, it's going through the sidewalls, but you saw how fast that zipped through the sand layer, right? This is still working its way, right? This is not even clay, okay? So the infiltration rate is vastly different in, and we're talking about saturated systems, okay? But water flow in, in a sandy soil is gonna be much, much more quick than in something that's silty or clay, okay? What about water retention? Okay, so that's water flow, okay? There's also something called water retention or water storage, okay? And when people think about soils, um, most people just focus on the solid portion. Okay? Soils actually behave like a sponge. Actually, this is a really good analogy for them. So soils behave like a sponge. That is, we have solid material, okay? But there's all these tiny little nooks and crannies and pores in here too, okay? And it turns out that if you actually, over here. So if we actually do this and, and immerse it in water, and if everybody's really quiet and listens and watches this, okay, you'll hear, You hear the bubbles, right? So water is displacing and moving in there and it's displacing gases. So the soil system is actually full of gases, water, and solids, okay? And further, because the soil behaves like a sponge, we have really good retention. So much so they can hold it against gravity, okay? Which one do you think would hold water better? A sandier soil or clay soil? Think about that castle that you can make at a beach, like a sand castle at a beach. How much water is being retained in that moat you make? A lot? Not much, right? So, sandy soils don't hold much water and they allow a lot, very fast water flow. 
clay soils hold onto water and actually they can hold it really, really, really tight. So tight that they, even plants can't get it, to be honest, sometimes in, in some cases. Um, but it holds it a lot better. But the infiltration rate is very low. Okay? So here's the thing, infiltration rate and store, water storage are actually inversely related to each other. The faster it zips through, the less is being retained. Okay? How do you think this influences fertilizers and pesticides in the soil? If we throw fertilizer or pesticide on to the lawn and it rains a lot in a sandy soil, we think there's a greater potential for it moving compared to a clay soil or a silt? Yes, for sure, right? Okay, but we have one more variable that is a huge factor issue, okay? okay? But soils are charged, which means they have a negative charge on it. And that's, this is important because this is our area, not tropical soil so much. So soil, soils are charged and they have a negative charge on it. So in this picture here, I've drawn a little like red hash mark just to kind of indicate that negative charge. You can think of this charge as like almost like an arm. It can grab onto something and it can hold onto something. Now it's not super fluid, but it's, it can hold onto and retain it against water flow, okay? Now, sands turns out does not have much charge. Okay, so I drew kind of just, this is not trying to be quantitative, but just kind of to indicate that, eh, not too much. A little bit, but very, very, very nominal, okay? Um, but because it has a negative charge, um, what, 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 if you've ever played with magnets, magnets will actually retain and be attracted to something else. What charge is it attracted to? The same? The, the opposite the, charge. Opposite charge, right? So it turns out that sands actually are, because they have a little bit of negative charge, they can hold on to positively charged molecules, okay? But remember, not too many arms to hold on to. So think of these little hands, these little charges, like something to grab onto, right? And if I can grab onto it and hold on to it, it's going to prevent it from leaching and moving down so readily. It's not, it's not, a, it's not like an absolute, and it's not super glued on it. It's just, it just has a better retention. Okay, so sands have this ability. Okay, but remember they don't have much charge. So it turns out that another really big variability, um, as far as fertilizers, pesticides, and how they move and interact in the soil, is going to be the texture of the soil. It depends upon the type, whether there's more sands or more clays. So it's not just about water and infiltration and storage, it's actually also about the amount of charge that's on the soil. Turns out, clays have a lot more charge. Okay, we're generalizing, there's a lot of different kinds of clays, but we're gonna generalize. So much so, that clays have like, an, they're like an octopus. They can grab onto tons of different things, okay? Which means, guess what they can do? They can grab onto tons of positively charged things. They can grab them like an octopus, grabbing onto all these different things and minimizing or slowing down how fast it moves through the soil system. Okay? Why does it matter how fast it's moving through the soil system? Well, one, we just put it on for our plants. We don't want it to zip through down, you know, out of the root zone, right? We want it to be retained. We also, we should be, okay, worried about things getting into the because once it gets in the groundwater, it can move into different systems, it can move into surface and all that kind of stuff. So we ought to be really concerned about what, how fast things are moving, okay? So clays are rock stars at this, okay? They can retain a lot more positively charged materials, which means, if you flip the sheet here, that means they can actually grab onto positively charged molecules, things that, like fertilizers and things that are new, we call nutrients. I'm going to say nutrients because nutrients has a soft, but that's something like has a, a good feel to it as opposed to a contaminant, right? If I said arsenic and lead to you, you probably wouldn't be so excited about it, but arsenic and lead, act, they can act as a positively charged um, ion or molecule as well. So soils can retain different things, and believe it or not, we actually don't want arsenic in our groundwater, so it's a good thing, okay? So we can retain things like uh, iron and sodium and magnesium and calcium. And these actually all behave as a positively charged ion or molecule in the soil system, which means soils can grab onto it. Which one grabs onto it better? Sands or clays? Clays. clays. Of course. Silts are in between, okay? They are much better than um, sands, but they're not the rock star that clays, okay? So, um, what about if we had a negatively charged? 
salt kill, what have you. What, how would that want to interact with the soil? And I'm saying soil, it doesn't matter if it's sand or clay. Would that want to be attracted to it? No. Just repel it. Fact, it actually is kind of repulsed from it. So, which one has a greater potential to move into groundwater? A positively or negatively charged ion or molecule? Negative. Negative. Okay. So, depending upon the chemistry and how this interacts in the soil, we have a much greater potential for some things actually to be end up in the groundwater a lot faster because water infiltration rate is high, uh, the charge is low, etc. Okay, so it turns out that sandy soils have this really high water infiltration rate, very low storage, and how many arms do they have to grab onto things? Not much, right? So the potential for things for for whether it's the good, the bad, or the ugly, whether it's a fertilizer we put on the ground, we want to stay in our plants, right? We want to get in our plants, or maybe a pesticide. The potential for that stuff getting into the groundwater or moving off site in a sandier soil is much, much higher than if there was more clay there, right? And remember, we have a lot of sandy soils in our area and we have a fair amount of you know precipitation as well. Okay? So let's let's apply this a little bit more, okay? Um, now, in if you bought just your general uh, garden variety, garden variety, that's just like four choice of words, um, uh, fertilizers, things like this, um, miracle grow, things like this, the three common nutrients you would find on the label that you're going to be buying are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Okay? And um, phosphorus is mined. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to focus on nitrogen and phosphorus. And all living organisms need a ton of nitrogen and phosphorus. We are, bo our bodies are made up of it, and all living organisms are. Which means, and that includes plants. Okay, so we call these macronutrients. They are needed in very large quantities. And farmers, gardeners, they're going to put lots of this on there. And the reason why you have to keep adding it is because if you think about what we do in gardening, we are growing something and then we're harvesting part of it, right? Which means we're actually taking it away. If we allow that material to actually decompose there and just like return the nutrients, we wouldn't have to keep fertilizing it. But the fact is, we're pulling out our carrots, we're taking tomatoes, we're picking apples. We can't keep pulling from the tree without giving something back because the, the tree is pulling nutrients from the ground, right? So you can't keep pulling, it's like, it's like taking money out of your bank account. You can't keep pulling money out and not putting anything back in, you're gonna run out of stuff. So if you're constantly harvesting, you have to do something Put nutrients back. So nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, what we call the, like our big macronutrients. We have micronutrients too, things like manganese, iron. They're used in smaller amounts, still valuable, still needed, but just not as much. So nitrogen and phosphorus are and potassium, but nitrogen and phosphorus in particular are really, really big nutrients that are needed. Okay. So people spend a lot of money putting this on, um, and they're very, very common. Okay. Phosphorus is mined. Okay? which means that in, in like Florida, we, Florida there are huge phosphorus mines, so we get a lot of phosphorus that is mined from the ground and put into you know, fertilizer, and then it's distributed you know, in a bag and we put it in our garden. Okay? Nitrogen is a different kind of beast. You know, okay? So um, there are a couple different forms of nitrogen you might find on a bottle or a label, okay? and I'm going to go over a couple of the common ones. Okay? So one of the common ones is called ammonium, okay? And ammonium, it sounds very common to ammonia. Ammonia is a gas, but ammonium is actually an ion, okay? And on here, on the page right here, um, there is a NH4 plus. So ammonium exists as a positive charge. As soon as it gets in the soil, it, 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 um, it forms an ion, I should say, okay? Um, and it's positively charged, okay? Another form is, that is very common to find on, on fertilizer um, bags and bottles is something called nitrate. And nitrate is NO3 minus, okay? And NO3 minus has a negative charge, okay? There, these are two very common types of nitrogen that you will find um, in bags and bottles and things like that. Um, which one do you think has a greater potential to move into our groundwater? Nitrate. Negative charge, nitrate. Okay, turns out nitrate causes blue baby syndrome. This is regulated by the EPA because it, it it is actually repulsed from most soils and it moves into the groundwater. Okay, 
okay? Just, it's just nitrogen though. It's just a common thing, but this form of it is repulsed from soils and if it's a high water infiltration rate, it's like zipping, bypassing everything. So it's like on a super highway, flushing past soils that might be able to grab onto it. That's a real bummer, okay? Um, here's another thing to consider when you're buying fertilizers is that um, uh, the, the, these fertilizers, when we're doing it this way, they are being produced um, by taking nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere, which is the biggest, this is our dominant gas in the atmosphere, and doing this crazy process that's very, very, very energy intensive to convert it into a form. So we're taking a gas and converting it into ammonia. This is really, it takes a huge amount of energy. So if you're concerned about climate change and emissions and all that kind of stuff, then these forms of, these kinds of fertilizers that we buy like this are actually very, very intense on the energy production. Usually when we think about climate change, we think about gasoline and what's coming out of our, you know, um, you know, emissions that way. But it's, there are many factors that lead into climate change and nitrogen, producing nitrogen fertilizer is a energy hog. It takes enormous amounts of energy, okay? Now, I will tell you, okay, just as a quick FYI, ammonium nitrogen changes in the soil. So when we put ammonium into the soil, it will eventually, with the help of some microbes, it changes into nitrate, okay? But the thing is, if we can add ammonia instead of nitrate, there's a greater potential, at least, for the soil to hold on to it for a little longer. And if it can hold on to it for a little longer, the roots might be able to get into it, right? And I'm not saying you don't, you can't use nitrate or anything like that, but it's also important to realize that the soil the type of soil you have is going to really influence, you know, maybe some considerations about nitrate as well, right? So nitrate versus ammonium, really big differences um, in, in how, where they're going to end up and how fast they need to be kind of pulled into the system, okay? Um, now, um, so we have, let's, let's talk a little bit about fertilizers here, okay? So there are, um, we have, like this one right here, um, Osmocot is labeled as a slow release plant food, okay? This one, Miracle Grow, is like the fast, quick thing, right? If your plant is suffering right now, this is not the best one to use, right? Because slow release is going to do this on a much more slower basis. Miracle Grow is like, this isn't a, what, we, what we want to think of as like, it's a really available form of the nutrient. So this is going to get into the system really fast, much more faster. This is why people on July 4th are running around, throwing around, throwing down um, nitrogen fertilizer on their lawn because nitrogen greens up the lawn. So if your lawn is looking really yellow, it could be a number of deficiencies, but nitrogen, because it's a macronutrient, it's probably one of the bigger ones. Okay, so that's why right, you know, the weekend before July 4th, everybody's running around buying fertilizer because they want their lawns to look green, okay? You would not want to put a slow release fertilizer on your lawn at that point because it's going to take a little more while to, to you know, to do its effect, okay? So there's a difference between kind of the fast acting ones, the slower stuff, and then what I'm going to focus on is the real slow release fertilizers like manure so manure and compost is what we consider to be a slow release fertilizer okay um, there's lots and lots of nutrients here it's super valuable okay and on top of it it's not just the elements of nitrogen phosphorus and potassium or whatever in here we also have the added benefit of it being full of organic carbon and this is wonderful because it actually is feeding all the microbial the microbes in the, in the soil system it's actually enriching the soil and the other thing about, um, oh, right here. So if we look at this, I'm just gonna kind of, we're a small group. So this is actually the manure, the chicken manure um, that, that's from there. And I would encourage, you know, oops, boxes, you know. Um, I'm gonna put one here, put one here, okay? And take a handful of manure, you know? and. Think about what the difference is between kind of your standard sandier soil, right? Okay, give it a little squeeze. <laughs> Not as a lot. <laughs> All right, so one, okay, there's a lot of moisture being held in this, right? This is a really sandy soil. 
and it's not going to hold much moisture. Okay, so even though we could put um, fertilizers in this, and it could be like the slow release or the you know the quicker stuff, right? It will give the nutrients to this, but it's not going to give the really rich organic carbon. And organic carbon is feeding all the microbes in the system. It's calling. It, it's it's like. It's this wonderful addition to the soil. We actually even call this a soil amendment so that it improves the soil. But here's the thing, it's not just improving it with nutrients. Can you make a guess as to how else this is improving the soil? Texture. Texture, yeah. And by that, what do you mean? Yes, very much so. It can hold a lot more water. So we could add compost manure to a sandy soil and greatly improve what's going on because now we're at, this is holding onto water really well so we're helping a sandier soil so in our region we have these fairly sandy soil we can add this stuff and really improve water relations and water storage which, all, which also can help with how much leaching is going on in the system okay so manure compost is adding nutrients it's adding um Organic carbon, it's helping improve water storage capability. And, are you ready for this? This is really cool. And we asked for a drum roll, but it's kind of hard in here. Ah, uh, yes. See, my, my, my current students have it right on cue when they say that. <laughs> okay, so. Um, oops, where am I? Uh, I lost my track. Um, the coolest thing is. Yes, thank you. Would you be able to hold this for a second? <laughs> I, I didn't include, the picture's not in here. That's why I'm like a little, a little lost. It's not in here. Dang it. Okay. Uh, well, the coolest thing. Let's go back to this, this picture. This, this will work. No, it's not a cool. That's not a cool picture for sure. <laughs> okay, let's go back to this picture where it has a little um, negative with a question mark here. Okay. I actually made another image. And I forgot to print it. Awesome. So. Remember how this just has our, our normal soils have negative charge, right? And it's repulsing the negative ions, right? The really, really cool thing here, and I'm kicking myself so hard for this, is that organic material, stuff like this, not now organic material could be a branch or a leaf, that's organic material, but when we say like the real power of organic material, or what we call humus or compost is the fact that this stuff is partially broken down. We can't tell what this was originally. We don't know if this came from, you know, uh, a Douglas fir branch or some maple leaves or your banana peels that you ate the other day, right? Um, all we know is this is really good organic material, okay? And the real cool thing about organic material is not only does it have the negative charges associated with it, but it also has positive charges associated with it. So, Organic material is way more complex and like you want to think about the skeleton of what soil is. Soil is definitely there's a structure to it. It's, there's a certain kind of like um, skeleton of how it's made and formed. Um, organic material, depending off it came from an apple core, or banana peel or you know maple leaf or, or whatever, it's going to have a different structure. Organic compounds are really, really diverse, which means that the organic material that you know compost um, is a product of is going to be really really diverse too okay but if we can safely say and generalize that this stuff this material organic material humus compost has not only negative charges so it can grab onto positive things but it also has positive charges so it can grab onto negative stuff so it is the bomb for holding on to different nutrients the good the bad the ugly and i say the good the bad and ugly because we you know, nutrients we give us a warm and soft feeling, right? Oh, good, right? Um, nobody's like, if I said arsenic to you, you'd probably, oh, it's not so good, right? But the thing is that that soils and, and organic material, things like this, actually do hold on to these things, and it's important, right? We, we want them to stay in the soil system and not get into our groundwaters, okay? So this stuff is really great because it can hold on to a wide variety of molecules, ions, it improves water storage, right? It's a source of carbon, right? So it can amend these kinds of soils that are a little bit more marginal and challenged to make them better soils. 
And the, typically they take humus, compost, and mix sand together and they call it topsoil, which is not so great. You know, I'm a soil scientist, I don't really call that topsoil, but it's it's certainly better than just the sandy soils. And you can see the dark, how dark the colors are different, right? And that's a real telltale sign because this humus and compost is typically on the darker side, these really, really dark browns and blacks. And this is a lot different than these very much more lighter colors here, okay? Do you have any questions about this? Okay, so um, this stuff is great, okay? Because it does a lot of things for the soil. It's also a slow release fertilizer. So this stuff, we call it a slow release fertilizer because it's slowly breaking down, further decomposing, releasing nutrients, right? If my plant was struggling and like about to die because it was so nitrogen efficient, this is not the product to use because it's slower to release, right? Then you give it a quick hot shot of this or something like that, right? It's like getting a, giving an espresso shot instead of uh, going, you know, doing something else, right? So you want a quick, quick fix, okay? All right, so now let's talk a little bit about pesticides. If you have, if you have any other questions about fertilizers. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about pesticides. And <clears throat> I'm gonna like get this out of the way here. Um, so pesticides are, generally speaking, they're gonna be a bit more of a different beast um, than fertilizers, okay? So fertilizers, we're talking about like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, things like that. Um, these are, they, they, they have similar properties in the fact that they're what I want you to remember is the negative and positive aspects, right? So soils can hold, soils, sand, silts, and clays can hold on to positively charged things, okay? Um, there is a difference in the water retention and how fast things are going, okay? But we had kind of kept it kind of simple. We were talking about magnesium and iron and nitrate and ammonium. These are kind of relatively simple molecules. When we start talking about things that, like, that we call it kind of um, synthetic pesticides and so forth, we start getting into what we call like a lot of more organic compounds. And these organic compounds, just like humus, they're way more complex. They got a lot more going on. They're not nearly as simple. And so if you flip to the second to last page, I just put a couple common um, uh, pesticides. Um, these actually turned out to be both herbicides. Um, so they're weed controllers. Um, so glyphosate is commonly known as Roundup, okay? Um, 2,4-D is a really, really common thing that you might find in like weed and feed. So these, like a lot of people are, are putting this kind of stuff. So weed and feed meaning, okay, we're gonna fertilize and we're gonna put some control to weeds, okay? Um, and the 2,4-D is actually, so this is more for grasses. So what 2,4-D is controlling are what they call broad leaf weeds. So not the grasses, but things that have a broader leaf basically, okay? Um, so 2,4-D, you can see right here, Okay, and the, only, the reason why I put these structures up is because I want you to realize how much more complex organic compounds, and by the way, these are kind of on the more simple side of things. So when we start talking about organic compounds with carbon and hydrogen and all these different, um, we call it functional groups, um, the, the chemistry gets outrageously more complex than talking about calcium, okay? And because of that, when these products are used, the fate of it is becomes a lot more complex too, okay? So because there's carbon and oxygen, all these different elements in here, um, when these products are used and it gets in, you know, hits the soil system, um, guess who starts to act on them pretty quickly? Can you make a guesses? Like what would start like actually breaking this down? So if you think about an oil spill, okay? Um, oil spills, they, can, they will get cleaned up by nature, slowly. Do you know why? Microbes? Yeah, microbes. Um, uh, oil is a carbon source. And so what you have are bacteria that are actually actively breaking this stuff down and they're using it as energy, as food, okay? So microbes and bacteria are so specialized, they can do things for us that no nothing else can do. And they're really, really novel different groups. So what when these kind of products get into the soil, bacteria, different bacteria, they'll do different things. They'll start breaking it apart, right? So this is what we call like kind of the parent molecules. And then it will start getting broken down by microbes, 
right? So what could enter the soil is say like a neutral compound, not having any sort of positive or negative. And I'm keeping this kind of simple. I'm just focusing on the positive and negative charges that might be associated with this. But we can have something like 2,4-D, which will start to be broken down and then it actually turns into a negative charge. So guess how mobile 2,4-D is in the soil? If it has a negative charge eventually. Very. Yeah. So we find 2,4-D more in water. Okay. Um, so what I'm trying to get through here is that that when we go into these kind of synthetic, or, you know, these kind of types of things, one, it's way more complex. They change, they break down, they degrade differently. Okay. Sometimes they can be held more by the soil, depending on the texture. Okay. Sometimes they're actually repulsed, and we find them in groundwater a lot more. Groundwater and surface waters. Okay. So products, it's, it's something to consider. It's also something to consider about like when you're applying things. Do you really need to apply something that's really broad spectrum or whatnot, okay? Um, so a lot of these are very broad spectrum. Um, I did want to show um, some of these, what we call like more, okay, they're called organic um, pesticides. I kind of have a little problem with that because organic um, in chemistry just means it has carbon. All of this has carbon. So it, I kind of have a problem with the usage, but we'll call them uh, more natural, we'll call them more earth, environmentally friendly, a little bit, they're a different breed than this. So these kind of pesticides typically are based a lot more on either compounds that have been derived from plants and they're mimicking. So a lot of things like uh, mustards and so forth have natural products that are really good at weed control. Um, some of these are, are like soaps. And so they act on for like insects. Uh, this one right here is an in insecticidal soap. So it's like a soap that actually acts on waxes and cu the cuticle um, in, in insects and breaks them down so they kind of suffocate. So a lot of these products are, they're, they're, they're great, um, but they are, you, they, you know, you can't um, administer it when it's rainy outside. You have to spray the underside of the leaves and that kind of stuff versus going out there with, you know, some sort of crazy broad spectrum um, insecticide. But broad spectrum insecticides, and when I say broad spectrum insecticides, I mean something that actually is kind of is killing off everything. And this is another thing that people do right before July 4th, is they want to kill off all those annoying little insects. They're killing off everything indiscriminately, not thinking about food chains or how this affects different systems or pollinators and so forth. So one of the things you can do, okay, besides kind of more gentle um, stuff, more things that are what we call more selective pesticides. Um, you can do what, um, you can use beneficial insects. So we actually, there's a term called beneficial insects. And so a lot of people are familiar with ladybugs or with more appropriately lady beetles. Um, and you can buy them in little cans and, and put them and disperse them in your garden. Um, another really common beneficial insect is what we call the green lacewing. And these are really common. Um, they, they're released to control other insects. So there are actually ways to do things that aren't maybe necessarily as harmful for the soil. Now, I'm not done extolling the benefits of this, okay? Because we just got through saying that a lot of these products are gonna zip through, all these really complex, these complex organic products are, are hard, they're more complex, some of these are harder for the soil to break down, some of these are harder for microbes to break down, um, and sometimes they're neutral. They don't have a positive or negative. They're just kind of like kind of there, so to speak. Okay, I'm already drum rolling all the benefits of the humans. Oh, God, this seems like awesome. Okay. <laughs> so it turns out that humus compost is really, really good at binding up even neutral things. So it can grab onto these kind of organic comp compounds. Okay. And I'm generalizing right now. It can grab onto the disease and hold on to it long enough that microbes can actually break it down, right? So instead of it zipping through the system really fast and, and getting into the waterways, if it can be held by compost and humus and other things, um, it can actually allow microbes the chance to start to break it down and they can use it for energy. So it's like a win-win situation, right? So I'm, I'm really, you know, hyping up compost and this manure kind of things because um, it, it does so much for our soil system. It also acts as a really great mulch 
Um, if you distribute it around um, plants, like in the winter or whatnot, it can, it actually, well, winter and summer, actually. So during summer, if you put a few inches around your plants, like trees and things like that, it reduces evaporation and water loss from the soil. Cause this is, it's like bubble wrap, right? It's kind of slowing things down. And then the benefit is this slowly breaks down with time and it releases the nutrients. So every spring, I don't do much to my fruit trees, but I actually do buy a bag of, you know, chicken manure. And chicken manure has a lot more bang for the buck um, because birds poop and pee, pee out of the same thing. So it's like got a lot more <laughs> bang for the buck than um, cow manure does actually. So it's worth the extra dollar or two a bag. And I distribute it around my fruit trees and it's gonna help with water storage and evaporation loss in summer. It's gonna slowly break down mulch can also compost can act as a weed barrier as well if, if you add enough so it's like win 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 right and the other thing i want to suggest is like compost and this this kind of stuff chicken manure is actually pretty expensive if you, especially if you're buying it in, in but you, one you could buy it in more bulk you don't have to buy in bags which would be better for less bags but the other thing is if you compost at your home you have free manure free 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 compost i should say okay um, and the real benefit of that, of composting at home instead of buying it, right, is that you're reducing the amount of trucks that are going to some sort of composting area and then packaging it and selling it back to you um, at Home Depot or whatnot. So, um, and most of our, you know, with the stuff that it's, now I'm, I'm going to say it's better for it to go to a compost area than a landfill. But if you can, and most people can because even places in Japan, they have like home composters and apartments and stuff like that. So you can actually compost in very small areas. It's, if you do it right, if you compost right, it doesn't have to be an attraction to vermin and rodents and all that kind of stuff. You wanna keep fats and meats out of your, proteins out of your compost bin. If you turn it regularly, it, you can have a finished product pretty quickly, reduce an incredible amount of waste that goes into landfills and have some amazing soil amendments that improves the whole microbial system, your plant growth, fertility, and improves water storage. It's like win, 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 win.